Hello, this is Andrew from Parlogram speaking with his voice. This video reaches you at the end of a really gear year for us and it's all due to you. When we made our first video on YouTube towards the end of 2017, we hoped everybody would like what had already been our type of music for several years already. But seriously, whether you've watched all 50 of our videos this year, or maybe this is your first one, I'd like to say a massive thanks to you and everyone who's watched the channel in 2022. So in this video, I'd like to take a look back and share with you some of the channel's highlights in 2022. So let's go. The number one album on my list is not a first pressing, or is it from the 1960s? It's not even British. It's this, the German second pressing of the Magical Mystery Tour LP. First pressings, like the US album, contain simulated stereo tracks on side two, and that wasn't good enough for the hi-fi loving Germans. So unlike Capital, Electrola made the effort to order true stereo mixes from Abbey Road, some of which, like Strawberry Fields Forever, were totally new mixes created just for this album. In doing so, they created one of the finest sounding Beatles LPs ever. It's easy to tell the difference between first and second pressings. First pressings have matrices which ended in dash one on both sides, and they carry simulated stereo mixes on side two, just like the US pressing. The one you want with all true stereo mixes has a B3 side two matrix. Being a Beatles fan in the Soviet Union in the 1960s was a difficult and sometimes dangerous thing to be. The Beatles music was branded as Western pollution and their records were banned and you really didn't want to get caught with them, or even worse, selling them. But one track was released on an official compilation album, and became the only Beatles track to be released in the Soviet Union in the 1960s. Official records, released via the state-run record company Melodia, stuck mainly to traditional folk or classical music. Amongst their releases was a series called Musical Kaleidoscope, which was a collection of tracks from various countries, consisting of carefully selected light pop music. Musical Kaleidoscope Volume 8 was released in late September 1967 by Melodia as a 10-track, 10 10-inch 10 album. The album is an eclectic but entertaining mix of tracks, all of which are in mono, but the sound quality is really excellent. But what Beatles track did they choose? Twist and Shout, She Loves You, A Hard Day's Night even. No, it was Girl from Rubber Soul. The label credits the song to the Beatles quartet, but Lennon and McCartney are not mentioned at all. Instead, the music and lyrics are marked as being traditional. Riding high on the success of the rock and roll music and live at the Hollywood Bowl albums, Capitol, to quote one of their executives, went swinging for the bleacher seats to make an album with 25 mushy tunes that grandma would love. As with rock and roll music and live at the Hollywood Bowl, it was Capital and not EMI who were the driving force behind the Love Songs package. Although the sound quality may be second rate, the original packaging certainly isn't, and is for me the most interesting and attractive aspect of this release. Mindful of the mauling the cover of the rock and roll music had received by none other than John Lennon himself, Capital pulled out all the stops to make this one one of their best looking packages, well, in the US anyway. Once again, Roy Kahara took charge of art direction, but the design this time was handled by Capital's in-house designer, Kenneth Anderson. Art director Anderson's idea for the gatefold was to use the so-called Mount Rushmore portraits taken by photographer Richard Avedon on August the 11th, 1967. In the original 1967 Mount Rushmore collage, Ringo was featured front and center, but Anderson wanted to put Paul in the foreground because he was, after all, the only Beatles still connected to Capital at the time. Anderson managed to convince Avdon into rebuilding the collage, and with a little airbrush retouching, remember, no Photoshop in those days, the new collage became both the logo and the inner gatefold for the album. It's really one of my favorite images of the Beatles. The photos of Paul and John in particular have a real timeless quality to them. In 1963, Capital Canada enjoyed one big advantage over Capital USA. Dave Dexter Jr. wasn't working for them. Instead, we'll turn the spotlight on his opposite number in Canada, Paul White, a man who couldn't have been more different. A few months after EMI purchased Capital in 1955, 
White was made an offer he couldn't refuse and became Capital Canada's singles promotion manager. And upon hearing Love Me Do, thought, that's different, and put it on his listen again pile. When he did listen to it again, he decided that he had to get it released. Love Me Do was released on Monday, February the 18th, 1963, but ended up selling just 78 copies. Brian Epstein and EMI were desperate to break into the American market. As the Beatles were not yet household names in Canada, Capitol felt they needed to employ some hard sell tactics. So they not only renamed the album Beatlemania, but also spiced up the front panel with some snappy journalistic quotes. That 10-inch master tape still exists in Capitol Canada's tape archive, but the tape itself has since been replaced with a later stereo master. It's possible that the mono reels, like so many other vintage reels, were just thrown out. But if anyone knows differently, please let me know. Once upon a time, or maybe twice, finding rare Beatles records was for most an impossible task. It was a world of myths and rumours, where your only hope of finding them was in the murky world of the bootleg. Then, in 1978, EMI released an album called Rarities, followed two years later by a Capitol Records Rarities collection. Rarities was initially conceived as a bonus album for the Beatles collection box set, which would be issued in December 1978. The album was compiled by EMI project manager Mike Heatley, together with the head of EMI Records reissue division, Colin Miles. Despite good intentions, the resulting album was very disappointing. Poor tape research and selection meant that tracks that were supposed to be in stereo weren't. EMI's failure to deliver with this album was indicative of their apathy towards the Beatles catalogue since the group had split. It was Capitol who'd taken up the reins in the 1970s, and it was they who'd instigated the hugely successful rock and roll music and love songs compilations, not to mention the Life at the Hollywood Bowl album. Using the same front panel artwork and tapes as the UK version, they produced 3,000 copies of this, which was designed to go into the box set. Although the album used the same tapes as the UK version, Capital substituted their own reverb-laden duophonic English language versions of I Want to Hold Your Hand and She Loves You, which diluted the concept of rarities even further. But then, a team at Capital, led by Randall Davis, decided that its content wasn't rare enough, and hatched a plan to come up with a rarities album worthy of that title. Capital released their version of rarities on March the 24th, 1980, containing a very different track listing to EMI's effort. John Lennon commented at the time the US album was released that it was a cool idea and was pleased it had come out. Paul McCartney was cooler about it, stating only that it was quite good. Opened in July 1922, the Hollywood Bowl is an impressive amphitheatre set against the Hollywood Hills, with a famous Hollywood sign to the northeast. Today, it's the home of the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra and hosts hundreds of musical events each year. Back in the 1960s, it hosted concerts not only by the Beatles, but by artists including Bob Dylan, the Rolling Stones, the Beach Boys, the Doors, Eric Burden and the Animals, and Jimi Hendrix. In order to get the Beatles to the bowl, Top 40 DJ and TV host Bob Eubanks paid Epstein $25,000 out of his own pocket. His investment was well rewarded when 18,700 fans turned up on the evening of August the 23rd, 1964. George Martin and Capitol Records producer Voyle Gilmore were on hand to produce the recording. But recording a rock and roll show in such a venue with only 100 watt Vox AC 30 amps in front of thousands of screaming girls was no easy task. The first problem was that three channels were just not enough to record the group. And with the noise of the screaming crowd around them, the engineers couldn't hear anything they were recording and just had to guess at the levels on their machines. Contrary to what some believe, there was no crowd track on the tape. It all came through the Beatles' microphones. Ringo's condenser mic over his drums being the chief culprit. So there was no chance to turn the crowd noise down later on. And spare a thought for those who were actually watching at the concert, they wouldn't have been able to hear any music at all. In contrast to the 1964 show, which had been the fifth on their itinerary that year, 
They arrived at the Hollywood Bowl this time around on the back of 16 gigs in 17 days, which had also included one in Canada. The Beatles were at this point tired, both physically and mentally, and although their performance was good, it lacked the sparkle and energy of the 1964 show. Martin and engineer Jeff Emmerich then set about selecting which tracks to use for the album. Of course, EQing the sound was a real challenge. Not only were the vocals mixed in with everything else on the tapes, but they were also very dry and lacking any ambiance. They fixed that by adding a kind of sound delay, which although totally artificial, made everything sound more open and gave it a more live sound. The 13 tracks they selected for the album comprised six from the 1964 concert and seven from the second 1965 show. Unfortunately for the designers, unlike the Shea Stadium tickets, the Hollywood Bowl tickets didn't have a photo of the Beatles on them. So, using the style of the Shea Stadium ticket, coupled with 1975 Hollywood Bowl shows by Joan Byers and America, they created their own. However, not only did they get the days wrong on the tickets, which were Sunday and not Saturday, the 1965 ticket should have been the one from Monday the 30th, as that was the date the recordings used on the album were made. But this album shouldn't be judged on sound quality alone. It's all about the performance. You don't need expensive equipment to enjoy it. The excitement and energy comes through on any device. The Beatles released 13 EPs in the UK between 1963 and 1967. But there was one title which was prepared but never released. EMI couldn't believe their luck. Everything they put into the shops was turning to gold. But unlike Capital, who being a bit behind had a few tracks in reserve, EMI didn't at this point have anything in the vaults which was ready for release. With demand at peak level and only the prospect of the Can't Buy Me Love single on the horizon, EMI drew up plans for yet another EP, which would be called Beatles Golden Discs. Side one would consist of She Loves You, followed by its B-side, I'll Get You, with I Want to Hold Your Hand and its B-side, This Boy, on side two. The tape was assembled and test labels were printed, which, as you can see here, still exist. But just as the mighty EMI machine was about to roll, the order came down, presumably from Brian Epstein, to stop. But never once to waste a good idea, EMI returned to the Golden Discs idea in December 1965 and came up with an EP called The Beatles' Million Sellers. The EP contained four of the five songs which had achieved Million Seller status up to that point. Million Sellers was similar in makeup to the cancelled Golden Discs EP, with She Loves You and I Want to Hold Your Hand on side one and their other two 1964 hits, Can't Buy Me Love and I Feel Fine on side two. The revival of this project caused an issue with the record's labels, as all were printed with the cancelled EP's Golden Discs title. Robert Whittaker's shot of the group added some incentive for fans, and it proved a steady seller over a three-month period into March 1966. On April the 10th, 1964, Capitol Records released their second Beatles album, which they called The Beatles' Second Album. 17 days later, Capital Canada released their third Beatles album, and they called that Long Tall Sally. Despite both looking very similar from a distance, they are quite different albums. For myself, who didn't grow up with either, both have their pluses and minuses. I'm not a fan of the sound of the second album, but with those Motown Detroit covers and blistering rock and roll standards, it truly rocks from start to finish, without any show tunes or ballads to spoil the excitement. Although the Canadian album sounds better to my ears, and with its one extra track is better value, Misery and This Boy sound out of place, and it isn't as thrilling overall as the US album. In 1999, Apple took one of the Beatles' least loved albums and transformed it into one of their best looking and greatest sounding to date. Today, the Yellow Submarine song track is regarded as one of, if not the best sounding Beatles remix projects. Despite minimal input from the Beatles themselves, the Yellow Submarine film has become one of their most endearing legacies. However, its accompanying soundtrack album is many fans' least favourite in their original 1960s catalogue. In September 1999, Apple decided to update the soundtrack album to tie in with the long overdue release of the Yellow Submarine film on video and DVD. 
Their graphic designer, Fiona Andrianelli, came up with this simple but striking design which was used over all the formats. Compared with the 1969 original, this new edition with its striking colours and superb gatefold is a real winner. But does the sound quality of the remixes match the quality of the design? With George Martin having now retired and his son Giles yet to be enrolled into the inner circle, the task of creating new stereo and 5.1 mixes fell to Abbey Road engineer Peter Cobbin. Cobbin had joined Abbey Road in 1995 and used his passion for analog equipment to help EMI rediscover and restore its legendary and forgotten equipment, coupling it with the latest digital technology for use on contemporary projects. Unlike today, where Giles Martin is actively encouraged to be creative with the remixes he does, Cobbin was under strict orders not to drastically alter the sacred works. The results were like nothing anyone had ever heard before. Cobbin described how Paul, George and Ringo were pleased with them and how they enjoyed the freshness of the new sound. The Songtrack album was released on September 13th, 1999 in the UK and one day later in the US, on CD and initially on limited edition yellow vinyl. One of the main improvements over the original mixes was the stereo imaging. That hard left-right panning of the originals was gone, and most now had centred vocals and better placed instrumentation. The automatic double tracking error on the first word of Eleanor Rigby was now corrected. However, this track did contain one major error in that the orchestration is very slightly out of sync with the vocals. A major highlight was the first true stereo mix of Only a Northern Song. Other highlights were the two spectacular sounding tracks from Rubber Soul, Nowhere Man especially. So why didn't Cobbin do any more Beatles remixes? Well, he did, kind of. His next project following Songtrack was mixing Anthology into 5.1 for the DVD release, which although few people have actually heard, was well received. But by the end of that, Cobbin had had enough of the pressure associated with working on Beatles projects, and from that point onwards decided to concentrate on film scores. But when one door closes, another one opens, and through it came Giles Martin. This also finally gave Apple the opportunity to attach a recognisable, media-friendly name on the remix projects, which it seems today has become just as important as the sound quality of the product itself. <laughs> At the time of release, it was greeted enthusiastically by the public as the new Beatles album. But from today's perspective, it's a really odd record. But while there are some truly great songs on here, a number of other worthy tracks which qualified for inclusion were overlooked. Whilst Love Me Do, From Me To You and Misery were probably seen as being too old fashioned for 1970, the omission of A Hard Day's Night, I'm Down and The Inner Light is more puzzling. Another obvious candidate for inclusion was Get Back, but that was presumably held back for the next album. Also, the inclusion of Don't Let Me Down on this album may have been responsible for its submission on Let It Be. But that wasn't the point. This album wasn't meant to be a gift for fans or even an artistic statement. It was designed purely to make money. For once, some proper tape research was done and Steckler made sure he acquired all the correct stereo mixes. Although track selection had been a tough job, finding a title for the album proved just as challenging. The first choice was the rather uninspiring The Beatles Again, and it was this which appeared on the labels of early first pressings. At least three prototype covers were produced, some of which included the Beatles Again title. But just as the album was going to press, they changed the name to Hey Jude. It was decided to leave the title off of the album completely, although early copies came with unmissable stickers on the front panel in various sizes. 
In 2007, Neil Aspinall claimed that the back cover was supposed to have been the front cover and vice versa, but the Klein had reversed them in error. Unless you're a collector, completist, or someone who bought it when it first came out, there is on the face of it no reason to own this album today. From a neutral's perspective, it's a real hodgepodge of an album, with its odd mix of early era songs colliding with late era songs, and it lacks any continuity or cohesion as an album. Now, unlike a lot of original US albums I've heard, this is a really good sounding disc. It's got an honest, straight down the middle kind of sound. It's forward and punchy, with no extremes, high or low. The only issue I can find is the early fade at the end of the Ballad of John and Yoko, where the final drum beat is almost lost. The 1971 UK export pressing, on the other hand, is a completely different sounding album. It has a more moderate tone, with a richer, deeper bass and a smoother high end. It's a true audiophile pressing. The Beatles' Apple Core has a problem. The Beatles' music is now well over 50 years old, and one of the challenges facing them today is how to make the Beatles' music relevant to a younger audience, who mostly listen to music on their phones. A clue emerged earlier this month when the Beatles' one album was released in Dolby Atmos Spatial, exclusively on online music platforms. But what exactly is this? And more importantly, is it good enough to attract a new generation to the Beatles' music? But now, there's a way of experiencing the Beatles' music in surround without knocking down the walls of your house or investing in all that hardware. You can do it on your phone, via Dolby Atmos Spatial Audio. But what exactly is that? Spatial audio is something that Apple have developed themselves. The idea is to place you inside the soundstage. Now, this only works on certain headphones, such as these AirPods Pro, but it is available on other makes of headphones too. As Giles Martin himself explained, the music doesn't get old, we get old. And his brief was to use Dolby Atmos Spatial to make the Beatles' music more engaging and accessible on the latest tech platforms. So how do the 27 tracks on this album, which don't forget span from Love Me Do all the way to The Long and Winding Road, sound in Dolby Atmos Spatial? The Atmos mix of Can't Buy Me Love is, like many of these early tracks, very mono-like, but without the energy and sparkle of the original mono mix. A Hard Day's Night is such a tour de force in mono, but it's the worst sounding Atmos track so far. It's a horrible sounding mess, which I think even Dave Dexter would be ashamed of. Whereas the halo effect of Atmos works well with a lot of instrumentation, it tends to make tracks like Yesterday sound very empty. But that's a general feature of spatial audio. Instead of bringing you close to the singer, it tends to push back the vocals in the mix. It's like the 1980s when everything had a ton of reverb attached to it, and in this case, it ruins the song. For me, the best sounding tracks were the ones that were recorded in early 1965 through 1966 which certainly bows well for remixes of Rubber Soul and Revolver. Now, a lot of people will tell you that the first pressings, UK ones especially, are the best. But whilst that may be true in a couple of cases, getting hold of those in top condition is risky and expensive. Let's first go back to the beginning. Well, mine, and in fact, many other second generation fans' gateway albums, 1962 to 1966 and 1967 to 70, otherwise known as the Red and the Blue albums. Although these are two separate albums, they both really should be regarded as one, and are the cornerstone of any Beatles collection. Although not as comprehensive or attractive as the Beatles collection set, this 8-album, 166-track box set sounds just as good as anything on BC13. It was issued in November 1980 by EMI's mail-order company World Records, not just in the UK, but in many other countries worldwide. The set was cut at Abbey Road by the Beatles' original cutting engineer, Harry Moss, and whilst not as comprehensive as BC-13, is remarkable value for money. Let's step away from the UK and European catalogue now and give some love to the Capital albums, and by far the best way to hear those is on these two 4CD sets. The Capital Albums Volume 1 contains Meet the Beatles, The Beatles' second album, Something New, and Beatles 65. Each includes both the mono and stereo versions of each album, which were superbly remastered from the original Capitol tapes by Ted Jensen. Volume 2 contains the early Beatles, Beatles 6, 
help and rubber sole. It's a little harder to find, but just as worth it. However, make sure you get the right version, as initially this set didn't have the true mono mixes, but fold downs of the stereo mixes. The easiest way to tell if you've got the correct one is by listening to I'm Looking Through You, where the stereo version has the false start, whilst on the mono it shouldn't. If the mono has the false start, then you've got the fold down version. Now, none of the items in this video are in the price bracket of a mint first pressing original, although some are rising in value as I speak, so be quick. In June 2006, Cirque du Soleil's Love Show opened at the Mirage Hotel in Las Vegas to rave reviews. Five months later, the Beatles' Love Album was released to similar reviews. But not everybody was happy. On one side were the purists who hated anyone messing with the original music and labelled the album as a cheap gimmick. On the other were those who thought it was a fun, harmless experiment and a refreshing take on the Beatles' music. But the truth is, this album was a game changer for the Beatles. The idea for that show began in 2000 with a conversation between Cirque du Soleil's founder Guy La Liberté and George Harrison at one of Guy's legendary parties. Work began on this soundtrack album in 2003, when head of Apple Neil Aspinall instructed Giles Martin to create a mashup demo of a gig that never happened. In 2004, the Beatles and their families gave their blessing to the project, and Abbey Road engineers set about building a studio to Giles' specifications. His collaborator on the project was none other than his father, the Beatles' original producer George Martin. Their first task was to transfer all of the original 1-inch 4 and 8-track masters from the original reels into Pro Tools for Mac, which looked like this at the time. Amazingly, this was the first time the Beatles tapes had been backed up properly. As it was created before today's D-Mix technology existed, the album leans heavily towards the later material, and due to it mostly being recorded live, little was selected from Let It Be. Mixing for an album is one thing, but mixing it for 360 degree sound through 8,000 speakers in an auditorium is another. They managed to do this by working on it in sections and bouncing their mixes onto a 16 track giga sampler. This enabled the sound to fly around in the headsets and a center speaker in the seats, and many of those elements are retained in the 5.1 surround mix. The CD was available as a standalone disc or in this double pack edition, which included an audio only DVD containing a slightly extended version in 5.1 surround sound. The double vinyl set followed a few weeks later, and like the CD, came with an elaborate but larger 28 page booklet featuring beautiful collages together with photographs and images from the show. For Giles Martin, this project served as a kind of audition or apprenticeship, if you like. His work on it is certainly impressive, and it's easy to see why he was given the job of remastering the catalogue, which emerged three years later. However, what made this album work so well was George Martin's involvement. His delicate and mature influence is something I think is much missed on the newer projects. The Yellow Submarine song track and Let It Be Naked, which preceded this album, had been well received by loyal fans, but lacked the wider appeal of anthology. But the Love album succeeded in capturing the wider public's imagination, especially among those who hadn't bought a Beatles album for many years. As well as attracting that mature audience, it also introduced a younger audience to the Beatles music, and like the Red and the Blue albums had done for fans like me, became a gateway album for a new generation. It also showed Apple that the public was still in love with the Beatles, and gave them the confidence to go ahead with projects such as Rock Band and the Mono and Stereo Remasters, which, lest we forget, were all released on the same day. It really ushered in a new golden age for Beatles fans and collectors, and in that respect makes it, I think, one of their most important albums. Japan has issued more Beatles vinyl than any country in the world. At one point in the 1970s, it had both the entire UK and US catalogue in print, not to mention its own unique domestic issues. But are they any good, and should you have them in your collection? 
As with the Beatles' discography in many countries, the interest for collectors lies mainly in the period pre-1966. The first two Japanese Beatles albums were released in spring 1964, and bore a remarkable resemblance to the first US albums. In fact, they even shared the same name. Both these albums, and indeed all the Beatles' 1960s Japanese pressings, were pressed initially on red vinyl. All red vinyl albums were pressed exclusively at Toshiba's pressing plant in Karaguchi, Saitama, which is located just outside Tokyo. These red vinyl pressings were given the brand name Everclean, and contained an added ingredient intended to prevent the buildup of static electricity. Another unique feature of Japanese albums is the obi. Now this translates as belt, and every album had one wrapped around its cover. Each obi was unique to a specific album, and being just a thin paper strip was extremely fragile. Each album also came with an insert, onto which all the lyrics were printed in English. The rear panel of the UK album cover carried a picture of the group in their Tokyo hotel room. The Japanese immediately noticed that the script on Paul's kimono was backwards, so they corrected the image by reversing it for their issue. The first major Beatles reissue series began in 1972 with the Forever series. These albums are chiefly identifiable by their distinctive green apple obi. That series was replaced in 1976 by the ever-popular Flag series of albums, so-called due to the country-specific flag on each album's obi. Whilst the quality of Japanese vinyl itself is of the highest quality and very quiet, one of the main issues with these pressings is the lack of bass. Whether that was because Japanese houses are small with thin walls or very close together, I don't know for sure. But the sound of Japanese pressings prioritizes the high end over the low. And that's basically the Japanese vinyl sound in a nutshell. Of course, it's a very broad generalization, and it suits some styles of music better than others. But as far as the Beatles music is concerned, I would recommend European pressings for sound quality. I love my vinyl collection, and I know that you love yours too. But is your love destroying your records? If you own vinyl records, this is maybe one of the most important videos you'll ever watch. PVC is a thermoplastic made up of 57% chlorine derived from industrial grade salt and 43% carbon derived predominantly from oil or gas via ethylene. It comes in two basic forms, rigid like this or flexible like this record cover. In order to change it from this to this, i.e. make it flexible, you have to add plasticizers. If your covers get too hot, the first indication that something is going wrong is that they begin to distort, producing this rippling effect. More seriously, if exposed to heat for a longer period, the plasticizer can start a reaction called off-gassing, also known as outgassing or degassing. The process is simply the airborne release of a chemical in vapor form. You'll know when it's happening because you can smell it. It has a very distinctive odor, very similar to that of fresh paint. And it's this which causes the clouding or mottling, just like we saw on that side of the revolver record. This is a 1979 UK first pressing of Pink Floyd's The Wall album. As with all first pressings, its front panel was blank. The wording was initially printed on a six and a half by four inch piece of flexible PVC, which sort of naturally adhered to the front panel. The problem with that was that if like this copy, it was left in place and subjected to heat, the sticker over time would begin to off gas. So what you can see here is that the vapor from the PVC sticker has leached through the cover and left a cloudy shadow on side one of the disc, which is the side that was facing the sticker. So do yourself a favor and steer well clear of them. Better still, go and check your covers, and if any of them are PVC, throw them away. Few recordings capture the sound of Beatlemania better than Twist and Shout. They performed it at nearly every concert for three years, and it became the inspiration for the best-selling EP in UK chart history, as well as their second Canadian album. Twist and Shout must be the greatest song the Beatles recorded but never wrote. Their ability to cover American pop R&B records and make them their own was unequaled in pop music and was a testament to their skill as musicians and performers. 
The song, in a shortened form to save John's voice, became one of the highlights and mainstays of the Beatles' live shows between 1963 and 1965. It also became the title of their debut four-track EP on Parlophone, which was released to popular demand on July 20th, 1963. The iconic photo on the EP cover was taken by a young photographer called Fiona Adams. On Thursday, April 18th, 1963, after a frustrating session at a cramped studio, they all piled into a taxi and went riding round London looking for locations. They spotted a demolition site on the Euston Road and got out to take some shots. Because the shoot was part of a paid assignment Adams was doing for Boyfriend magazine, she wouldn't receive a credit on the cover. Thankfully, in later years, she did enjoy the recognition she deserved before passing away in July 2020. If you own a copy of the Beatles' White Album on vinyl, there's a good chance it has its own unique number on the front cover. But what's the story behind those numbers, and how were they produced? And what happened to the earliest numbers, and who got them? And how much are they worth today? It's remarkable that such a simple, plain package could be the source of so much fascination and endless discussion over the past 54 years. You could fill an entire YouTube channel for a year with videos about this album and still not be done. The design instructions were very strict. The number was to consist of seven figures preceded by an NO prefix, with a full point dot positioned as near to the numbers as possible. Although EMI was famous for its quality control, early production mistakes did manage to slip through, such as cover number 18. This was put together basically inside out, and the only thing in the correct place was the number. As you can see, the flaps are on the front, and the rear panel has the spine text partway across it. The Beatles' wording appears in the right position, but on the inside of the gatefold, across Paul and George. Although EMI had just introduced semi-automatic record sleeving, they could only handle single albums, let alone top opening doubles with inserts. Therefore, EMI had no choice but to draft in extra labour and go back to the old hand sleeving operation. This operation was carried out by 150 female staff, sat at 110 tables alongside a Flowlink carousel conveyor, which delivered the records directly to them. Here, you can see boxes of white albums being loaded into the EMI vans. Normal single albums were packed together in boxes of 25 each, but this, being a double album, meant that only 12 could be packed into a single box. Also, the late arrival of the sleeves at the factory meant that not all copies made it to the stores during that first week of release. Rather than delay the release, EMI rationed supplies to stores by 40%. I bought my first white album in 1980, it was a second-hand mono-pressing, which cost me £9.99 from The Beat Goes On in Cambridge. And like all original White Albums, it has an individually numbered cover, which in this case is 095357. The first batch of covers were made to house the mono edition, which were numbered from 0 to 299,999. Copies numbered 300,000 to 599,999 were primarily for stereo copies. This is the highest numbered copy I own, and it's 618,505, although it's believed that the original numbers go up to around the 630,000 mark. The most famous number which has emerged to date was UK number one, which was owned by Ringo. He sold it at an auction of his personal possessions in December 2015, for $790,000. Up to that point, the earliest UK copy to come to market was number five, which was sold by us in November 2008 for $22,000. Now, here's an odd thing. This is number three, which appears in the book for the White Album Deluxe set and is marked as being Paul's personal copy. But the legend of there being multiple copies of early numbers is backed up by this picture, which appears to show another number three. But is it the same copy? Comparing this one and Paul's from the book, the difference in wear and discoloration leads me to believe that these are two different copies. Do you remember what you were doing on Saturday, November the 12th, 1983? I was in W. H. Smith's in Huntingdon, buying this copy of Paul McCartney's new album, Pipes of Peace. But what's so special about a bag? The record shop bag was an essential part of the record buying experience. 
It was something which you carried with pride and paraded on the journey from the shop to home. It didn't matter what was inside, you couldn't really see anyway. It just said, look at me, I've bought a record and I'm proud of it. And that made me feel good. So good, in fact, that when I got home, I couldn't bear to throw it away. I wanted to hang on to every part of that record buying experience. Not only did I keep most of the bags and the records that I bought, which date mainly from my peak buying record days of 1980 to 1982, but I've also, like Johnny, managed to acquire a decent collection of vintage ones over the years. Now, I bought most of my chart records at a UK chain of shops called WH Smiths, who also sold magazines and books, etc. But I did occasionally stray into Woolworths for the odd single or two. Woolworths made it easy to remember the date you bought a record, for they had a secret practice of attaching a small sticker inside the cover, onto which they wrote their branch number and the date of purchase. It was a simple but clever system that meant if you tried to return a record and the sticker was missing, it meant that you hadn't bought the record at that branch and you wouldn't get a refund. Now I've got one of those stickers on my copy of Starting Over, which tells me that I bought it on the 20th of November, 1980. Such was my passion for all things vinyl, I naturally ended up working in a record shop, which was called Our Price Records, and I worked at their branches in Cambridge between October 1985 and February 1988. Our Price were a great chain of independent record shops, until WH Smith bought them in 1986, after which they were swallowed up by Virgin, who eventually threw them on the scrap heap in 2001. If you've seen the Beatles' recent Get Back film, you may record a scene in the studios at Savile Row where George unpacks a selection of albums. Well, here is one of those exact same bags. Sometimes the bag became an integral part of the album itself. The most well-known example of this was John and Yoko's 1968 album, Unfinished Music No. 1, Two Virgins. Most were obtained by mail order using this order form. If you did find a retailer who stocked it, it's more than likely it would have been dispensed to you in the same fashion as a dirty magazine, which is in a plain brown bag. In the US, however, the brown bag became part of the album cover. This took the form of a brown slip cover into which the album was inserted. And it had verses of Genesis chapter 2 printed on the reverse. Every collector has a holy grail. For car collectors, it might be a Ferrari 250 GTO. For comic collectors, it could be some original artwork. Or how about a first edition of Harry Potter for book collectors? For Beatles collectors, it might be a gold stereo Please Please Me. Or a signed album. I'm Andrew from Parlogram Auctions, and this is one of mine, an original EMI master tape. Well, this is a genuine production master tape of Let It Be, which was made at Abbey Road on January the 10th, 1972. It's housed in a blue and white Emmy tape box with a studio label stuck onto one side. The first thing you'll notice is that the running order is that of the cassette and eight track. So clearly this isn't a vinyl album master tape. In fact, the tape number is marked as being CCM27. Now, I don't know what that means exactly, but my guess is that CCM stands for Compact Cassette Master. In the matrix column number on the front, it says TCPCS7096, which was the UK cassette number. And the track list matches that cassette, which due to timing was different to that of the LP. Also, I can just make out that this tape was copied in room 3 at 15 inches per second. The tape itself is type 815, which was being used for all recordings by EMI at that time, including Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. It's marked, of course, as stereo, and this has an IEC equalization curve, which was the European equivalent to the North American NAB system. But where did this tape end up? The clue is on the back of the box. And it's this, an inlay from an Australian cassette. And here's an odd thing. As you can see from the note written in red ink, the tape has been reassembled back into the LP track order. And before it fell off, this Australian label was attached to the box, 
and that design was in use between April 1982 to June 1987. My next big question was, of course, what does it sound like and does it still even play? But before I could do that, I had to find a machine to play it on. And this is what I got. It's a Revox B77 Mark I. It's a twin track machine, but more importantly, it can play tapes at 15 inches per second. One of the things I'm interested in with this tape is how it sounds in comparison to the original vinyl. And what, if anything, is different about a cassette master as opposed to a vinyl cutting master. The size of the waveform, especially in the quieter sections, suggests that this cassette master reel has been intentionally mastered at a higher level than the vinyl cutting tape. This, no doubt, was to compensate for the cassette's much higher noise floor. As you can see, it's very similar to the reel above. In fact, it's virtually identical. Therefore, I think we can confirm that this is indeed a copy of the original UK cassette duplication master. Now, that may sound a bit second rate, but the sound quality really is amazing. It's like listening in another dimension. The magic is all in those mid-range frequencies and it brings out textures and colors in the music I've never heard before. All I need to do now is find side two.